means that uh, if you understand, if a man's full of anger and hatred, he's a very unhappy person. And I was that person. But what it did do, because I found a key to get the anger to work in my favor. I'm a short person, uh, but I managed to get in, I was about 17, and I managed to get in the first division league playing for Glenwood Soccer Club. I didn't play regularly, but I got a number of games in the first division. And I, I was actually a member of the under-18 side. And what I discovered was that if I psyched myself up with all this anger, this pent-up ill feeling, uh, I could just about blow anybody. I could knock people, I could bump people, I could run. And it was that anger was motivating me. And on this particular day, it was Durban, the city of Durban, playing the city of Johannesburg. And if I, it was a curtain raiser to some inter-provincial soccer match. And it took place at King's Mead, which we call Old King's Mead today. And uh, during the game, I, I was playing centre half for Durban, and I had to mark this fellow from Johannesburg, who was the centre forward, and he's six foot plus, and his name, if I remember correctly, was Sausage Coleman. He would look like a sausage, thin, tall. Uh, and so what they were trying to do, uh, centre the ball high where they could take advantage of his height, and me being short, I couldn't do very much about it, they figured. But I'd learned a few tricks, and one of them was that if I can get the player between the referee and myself, all I gotta do is use my finger. I put my finger in his pants, an elastic, elasticized pants, when he jumps up, his pants come down, so he's gotta bend down and pull up his pants, and I played him right out of the game, but. He got so angry and furious that he uh, swung around on me during the game and he said, you are the kind of basket that would crucify Jesus Christ. Well, that's not the kind of comment you'd expect to get on a soccer field. And it kind of blew me away. And because God was my enemy anyway, um, I decided I'll teach us big six-foot guy lesson, and I really played rough. How I never got sent off is a mystery. The only thing I found out afterwards, the crowd were behind me because I was so small and he was so big, and, of course, the crowd was pro-Durban because the game took place in Durban. So I got away with a lot that particular game. But when we went into the change room and to shower, I went into the shower, and you know, all around you, you've got the normal aftermatch uh, talk and laughter, patting on the back or whatever. It was. it was just a lot of noise, which I usually got involved in. But for some reason, I just walked into the shower and I was showering. And this thought hit me like a thunderbolt. Uh, you need to pray. You need to talk to God, and well, there's no reason for that thought. It it just hit me like a like an atomic bomb, but I also felt a presence in the shower, and I knew that I'd reached decision time. I knew that. What decision? Why? I had no idea, but something was happening around me, and I remember thinking, "What?" in the world are you going to, what am I supposed to say? I knew uh, grandma used to say grace. And I thought, I know that's not going to work. That's not, not going to do it. I knew that. So I thought, well, I'll have to make up a prayer right here, you know, but I don't want all the guys out there to hear. So I had the shower coming on me and I said, Jesus, I've come. And even today it... Um, it emotionally affects me. That happened over 60 years ago. But it's as real today as it was that day. A hand to me came out of the shower rose, 
grabbed the back of my neck right here and pulled. And I felt roots. I know you people laugh about this, but I felt them coming out of me. I've, it's so real. When they came out, I never prayed anything else. All I said, Jesus, I've come. Well, I was crying. You can't walk out in the change room crying with all those guys. I felt that I couldn't do. And you, uh, so I stayed under the shower a little while to try and get composed, which I never really did completely. And I just went and got dressed. And all the guys now, you know, they're all going to watch the big game, the main game. But I just got dressed and quietly walked out, and I walked home. And um, when I got home, it was Saturday night, and I thought, well, I'm not going anywhere tonight. I just can't. I just didn't feel I could do that. Something had happened to me. So I just went to bed. I remember my mother came and she said, are you okay? You're sick. I said, no, I'm just going to have a dirty night. And I went to bed and I slept the whole night. In the morning, I woke up and I could not believe what happened. I could hear birds singing. I never heard that before. And Dudley Norse, the South African cricket captain, lived right next door to us. And he, did, he had birds from all around the world. And, uh, but I'd never heard them. Never heard them until that morning. And then I got dressed and I came to the breakfast uh, table. But as I walked into the breakfast room, my mother looked at me and said, What's happened to you? I said, nothing, why? She said, your face is glowing. And then I remembered the shower. And I felt this, I wanted to cry again. Now remember, I had a stroke and I never cried. I refused to cry. I'd never cried in my life. I got beat up, but I would not cry. Never would I cry. So I, I just spun around, went back into the bedroom and looked in the mirror. Well, I looked the same to me. I mean, I didn't see any different. But then things happened that were quite incredible. Every morning when I woke up, that same presence that was in the shower was sitting at the end of my bed. And I thought that was the Lord. If it wasn't the Lord, it was the Holy Spirit. If it wasn't the Holy Spirit, it was an angel. But someone sat at the end of my bed. And I came to the conclusion at about, I was 16, I think, at the time. I came to the conclusion that God had sat up all night watching me, looking after me. Who else could be sitting on my bed? It had to be God or Jesus sitting at the end of my bed. And then he spoke to me. Now, when I say spoke to me, he spoke in a different way. It was in my heart. It was thoughts just bombarded me, and I answered them. But I answered them audibly. And that went on for six months. He taught me, he told me I have to forgive certain people. I said, but they owe me money, and they've lied, and they've cheated. And he said, well, I've forgiven you of everything. I said, yeah, well, that's easy for you, but it was more difficult for me because I need the money and I need that. He said, but he'd say to me, but I'm asking you to forgive them. I don't want to forgive them, I tell him. But for you, I'll do it. But uh, this is silly. They're just going to think I'm weak. and you know. So after six months of that, every morning having a teaching from the Lord, I decided I'd buy a Bible. And the reason I decided to buy a Bible because I tried to read the Bible on a mantelpiece that we had at home and it never worked. I couldn't understand it. So I went to the uh, CNA in Durham. But you know, if you're 16 years of age and you're going to buy a Bible, you feel a bit you know, sissified, I suppose. So what I did, I, I walked in and I walked around, walked around, 
until there was one old lady serving. She looked like an old auntie, so I felt reasonably safe. And I went and asked her for a Bible. And to my amazement, she said to me, what translation do you want? Well, I didn't know there were translations. I just knew there was a Bible. And so I said, I don't think it matters. But if you've got one with pictures, that'll help. Because I figured if it gets boring, you know, I can always look at the pictures, you see. And uh, fortunately, she gave me a King James Bible. And I started in the beginning. And suddenly, it began to make sense. And to my absolute amazement, I discovered what I had been talking to the Lord or the angel or God at the end of my bed every morning was in the book. It, that absolutely blew my mind, but it gave me such confidence to trust the Bible because I first got it from God. And if you'd, when I used to try and tell my soccer mates and cricket mates about uh, Jesus, I didn't know about things like you've got to repent. I didn't know about... Uh, what repentance meant, I didn't know you how to read the Bible, but what I did know was I knew that my sins were forgiven. That's what I knew. I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew that I was being delivered from that and I could live another life. In fact, my friends, uh, some so-called friends and some genuine friends, they could see the change. They see and saw more than I saw. That, some of them walked away from me, some wouldn't talk to me, and some came along because they wondered what I had. But from my point of view, it was life changing. It, it created within me something that I'd never experienced before. <clears throat> all the anger was gone. If you've been loaded and overloaded with anger all your life, and suddenly it goes, disappears, it's gone. I could not get angry. I just could not get angry. And, uh, and, and, and I didn't feel I wanted to hit out at anybody. It was a new experience. You know, the, it says you're a new creature somewhere in the Bible. Well, that was me. My parents couldn't understand it. Uh, it was that bad that my father took me to go and see the Reverend Duell in the Gravel Presbyterian Church to see what was wrong with me because they figured I was going off my head. That's what they thought. And I'll never forget the Reverend Duell, he had a chat to me. I told him my part of my experience, what happened, what happened. And he patted me on the back of my head and he said, never mind, son, you'll grow out of it. Well, thank God I've never grown out of it. I've tried to grow into it. Uh, but he, they didn't understand salvation. They didn't understand what I'd experienced anyway. And I cannot thank God enough for meeting me. And I've never seen that soccer player again. Never. And I don't know whether he was Christian or not a Christian. But when he said, you're the kind of guy that would have crucified Jesus. He's right. I was an enemy of God. And I think when I was all stirred up, if Jesus had come in front of me, I would have killed him because I saw he attacked me when I was a boy. I had this polio or stroke. Uh, it, it just seemed to be that he was a bully. That's how I saw it. Suddenly, just like this, turn a page, it's completely different. Uh, and so that's my experience of how I really came to know the Lord in my, that way. But the most difficult and odd thing that happened, whilst I knew the Lord, uh, and, and I was growing nicely, and I'm young, you want to meet girls and what have you, and <clears throat> all those, and you need fellowship and parties. When I went to the parties that I had been going to, uh, you know, a bit of drinking and nonsense, I, I didn't fit. I couldn't understand why I didn't fit. Because every party there'd be a rumble. Uh, somewhere afterwards you'd go out and have a fight or something. But 
I couldn't do it anymore. In actual fact, I couldn't even play soccer properly because I'd lost that anger, that driving force that, that made me go and do things. Now I was more, what's a soccer match? That was more my attitude, you know. Who cares how many goals you got? You know, I've, I've met God, I've met divinity, I've met creation. I, I didn't know what I'd, who I met, what I met, but I knew I was different. And nobody can convince me otherwise. I met God, and God came into that shower. Uh, people laugh at me and say, what did God come into the shower for? Well, he did. That's where I was. So my life changed. So I, I looked around for a, a church. Uh, that I tried the Presbyterian church, and they didn't work. I tried the Anglicans. It didn't seem to work. And the, the young people in those groups I don't know, they lacked something. They, they didn't have drive in them. They were, uh, I, I just, I didn't fit. Then I heard about this church at Cartwright Flats where they uh, spoke in tongues and they did all weird things, swung from the chandeliers and, you know, looked for Jesus under the seat and all that stuff. And I thought, well, that'd be an exciting place to go. So I went. And um, I picked a Sunday morning and that church was packed, and they sang like crazy. They just kept singing and singing and singing. I'd never been to church, and everybody seemed reasonably happy. That was another thing that shook me. How the heck can you be happy in church? It's, it's, it's a sad place. That's my experience. And now they're all happy. But something happened the first morning that I went there. In the front row there was a girl in a white dress sitting there, next to an old man, and something said to me, that's the girl you need. That's the girl I got for you, or something. I don't quite know how this happened, but that my eyes got fixed on her, and I said, there she is. <clears throat> now, I wasn't in no hurry to get married or anything, but somehow I knew that person. When the church was over, they had a center aisle, and everybody's coming out the center aisle. And incidentally, every woman wore a hat, a, a big hat like sombrellos, and all, you know, some with carrots on top, and some with bananas. They all, it was a fashion parade in a way. But as they were all coming out, I decided to go down there and introduce myself to this girl. And that was out of character with me, really, because It's just a thing I wouldn't think of doing, but I just did it. But when I got down to the front, um, this uh, girl in the white dress, she, she was a bit odd. She knew I came. She, her eyes saw me coming, I know that. And when I got close to them, she went and stood on the other side of this old man. So I had to walk around the old man, and she walked around. So she was keeping this guy between us, and I figured, well, that has to be his, her father. So. so I said to him, I'm Bob Trench, and he told me, he's my not, and we shook hands. And um, I got her name. That's all I got, uh, her name. And I think the old boy knew that was after his daughter, so he wasn't very happy with me, so I, I didn't make much progress there. But I knew there's one good thing in the church at least, and that was that girl. And it took me a while to find out where she lived and... Uh, in fact, uh, the only way I could find her was if somebody was going to take her out that Saturday night, and I latched on to him, and I said, I'm coming with you. He said, you can't come with me. I said, you watch. And that's how I found out where she lived. And uh, about six, seven years later, we got married. We got, we've been together 51 years now. <laughs>